All right, um, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining our session today. As you all know, today's session will be covering SPHERE standards. And we're also looking at how does these standards enhance the effectiveness and quality of disaster response. So as, again, as you all know, it is uh, an established in 1997, the SPHERE moment uh, aimed to enhance humanitarian work in disaster response. The SPHERE handbook uh, is renowned globally and sets universal standards in areas like WASH, food security, shelter, and health. And these standards ensure protection and assistance for crisis-affected individuals while preserving dignity. Uh, sphere standards are widely recognized, serving as a crucial benchmark for agencies, organizations, governments, and donors. And today uh, at Sphere India Academy, we are hosting this session to enhance practitioners like yours understanding and implementation of these standards, fostering a commitment uh, to excellence in humanitarian response. So once again, welcome and thank you all for being a part of this crucial training. And we have amazing resource persons with us and I'm so happy to welcome both of our speakers to this session. Initially, I would like to welcome uh, Ms. Felicity Fallon, who is working as learning and events manager at Sphere. She joined Sphere in 2021. Uh, prior to that, she worked in education, tourism, and heritage. Her roles have encompassed teaching, training, and business development for the public and private sectors. She is a co-founder and chair of Lake 8, an association supporting displaced children and families in France. Um, Ma'am, it's a privilege to have you as have you with us uh, today, and I would like to hand it over to you to give an introductory keynote address yeah. welcome okay um thank you, thank you very much hannah um are you able to open the powerpoint or shall i get going uh, ma'am we are trying it in the back end so as you start we'll be checking on that yeah. okay great um well Hello, everybody. And first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me today. It is a great honor to be invited to meet uh, with Sphere India um, and to talk to you. Um, so we're here today to talk about Sphere. Um, Sphere is about shared humanitarian principles um, and life-saving actions um, to enable us to deliver accountable and quality humanitarian response um, while preserving the dignity of crisis affected people. Um, I don't think you need to tell me, uh, I don't think you need me to tell you about the state of the world that we are living in at the moment. Um, we have wars, we have genocides, we have uh, populist governments, uh, we have economic crises, we have pandemics, and on top of that, we have the increasingly felt impacts of climate change. Um, so we need standards and we need humanitarian standards now more than ever to enable us to deliver a response that is of quality, that is accountable, um, that enables us to be accountable to all our stakeholders, not just donors, but also our colleagues and our partner organizations and the people that we are serving. Um, we need humanitarian standards so that we have a roadmap, so that when a crisis happens, we know what we're doing. We know what we want to do. We know how we want to do it. Um, and also with humanitarian standards and the Sphere Handbook, um, we have a shared common language so that when you have different people um, interacting in a humanitarian response, be they the government, be they military, be they medical, be they an international NGO, a local NGO, a voluntary organization, a civil society organization, a group of volunteers with the Sphere Handbook, they have a common language. Um, and a shared roadmap, helping them uh, to work together to find uh, effective, efficient, and respectful solutions. 
Um, so Spear is, um, as Hannah said, it's the longest standing set of humanitarian standards. Um, and Spear celebrated its 25th birthday last year. And people often think that Spear is, is a very large organization. And it is. It is present in every country in the world in some way or another, which is a remarkable achievement in 25 years. Um, but I'm representing today the Spear Secretariat in Geneva, which is actually just seven people. We're an extremely lean and agile secretariat. But that's because we have the amazing support of the Spear community, which has grown organically over the last 20 years, 25 years, um, not because people are paid to do it, but because they believe in it and they see the value of the standards and they want to promote them in their country. So Spear now has over 70 focal point organizations, which are voluntary organizations like Spear India, who have put their hands up and said, we want to promote Sphere in India. So we have 70 organizations like Sphere India, not all as big, um, some are very small, um, and they are all promoting Sphere standards in over 50 different countries. We have over 170 listed Sphere trainers. And I say listed, those are the ones that are on the Sphere website, but there are many, many, many more people delivering Sphere training every day um, in the world. And we're extremely lucky today to have Subhashish Roy with us, who is a listed Sphere trainer. Um, so, and I, I will be, you know, handing over to Subhashish very, very shortly. So we have our trainers, we have our focal points, we have our members. There are over 50 Sphere members in the world who pay a subscription fee, which helps to support Sphere. Um, but above all, we have the Sphere practitioners, um, the people who apply Sphere in, in their everyday work. And that might be planning a project, it might be delivering a project, it might be evaluating a project. Um, and who are these practitioners? As I said, they can come from um, government organizations or they can come from UN agencies, or they can be international NGOs or local NGOs. Um, it's an enormous worldwide community. Um, and we don't even know how many people are, are, are in that community because everything that Sphere does is open source. Everything is free of use. We don't count how many people are using Sphere, but we just try to make the Sphere handbook as accessible as we can and available as we can. And so it is now available in 50 different languages. I won't list them all, um, but it's quite an achievement. Um, and I can tell you that at least six more translations are, are currently um, being undertaken. So I, I will stop there, um, but I just want to say, you know, if you're in this webinar, then that means you are part of the Sphere community and part of the Sphere family. And Sphere India is there to help you, but also, we at the Secretariat are there to help you. And I will give Hannah my email address at the end of this. I am Learning and Events Manager. So I look after all training and learning resources. And if you ever have a question about anything to do with Sphere, please contact me. We are very approachable. We are here to help. We are here to serve you. Um, thank you, Hannah. I will stop there. And I will hand over to Subhashis Roy, um, our spear trainer for today. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much for highlighting when and where and how can we get the sphere resources and uh, how can we understand that better. Thank you so much for that address. I'm sorry for the PPT. Uh, there were some technical issues and anyway thank you so much for coming uh, moving on uh, I would like to welcome our trainer for the day uh, Mr. Subhashish Roy uh, he is currently working as a program manager at Lutheran Disaster Response International and also he is a sphere trainer 
an international humanitarian practitioner with strong academics and extensive experience of 19 years in humanitarian program management. His area of expertise include integration of principles humanitarian response through climate resilience, quality and accountability, core humanitarian standards, disaster readiness and disaster preparedness and response plan. Currently, he is leading and managing Q&A standards in disaster relief operations, disaster risk reduction, resilience and thematic specialization on food security, wash, shelter, protection principles, cash transfer modality, and human resource management within Asia, Middle East, Africa, Europe, and Latin American region. He's also serving as a certified international trainer on Sphere, CHS, DRR, and Resilience. He's an excellent leader with an ability to lead agencies or nation building initiative, specialist in working in different response options such as cash transfer, in kind of ser or service oriented humanitarian response. Sir, we are privileged to have you as with, with us leading the session. Without any further delay, I would like to hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Hannah, for the wonderful introduction and welcome all of you for this wonderful session on Sphere Standards. I'm not aware about uh, the, the background that all of you possess actually at this particular moment, like whether you are from the humanitarian sector or, you know, whether you are following the Sphere Standards or not. And this particular session that has been given to me is just to give a overview actually of the sphere standards because it is a huge actually so if you see the sphere book it is almost 380 390 pages book actually um so i will give just the glimpse of the sphere and a little bit of my experience how we have used a uh, sphere actually so the way i am doing the training program in different parts of the world in the same way i'm also practicing sphere in my portfolio just uh, one thing i like to add to hannah's introduction part uh, lutheran disaster response international is the unit of my organization my organization name is evangelical lutheran church in america which is based in chicago usa and uh, this particular uh, organization is not a uh, implementing agency it is a donor agency so we provide the financial support to the different uh, organizations ngos who are executing the humanitarian response across the globe one of the component that is highlighting at this particular time is ukraine response gaza response and many other humanitarian crises that is happening across the globe, including in Africa, Asia, Middle East, and Europe. So with this, let me start with uh, a very brief uh, overview. I will go quick today, but don't hesitate by end of the sessions if you if you have some questions for me, or if, if it is not possible to ask questions for this webinar, definitely you can reach out to me and ask questions on those technicalities which can help you to execute your task in an efficient manner. Okay, Hannah, can I request you to uh, share the screen for the PowerPoint or do you want me to share? Okay, so um, what I'm doing this one is that we always say that sphere, and uh, I have given this quote is fair for all of us. And, um, you know, sphere is always useful. I am practicing sphere since 2009 onwards. And as uh, Felicity was talking about the long history of the sphere, in India also, the sphere history is not new. Uh, you know, if I if I'm not wrong, I have seen the sphere practitioners in India for last 15 years, you know, I can see that 15, 20 years, actually. So this is not a new concept, but yes, definitely a lot of revisions happen. We are trying to make it more and more realistic based on the humanitarian context and the changing environments. So let's start sphere for all of us. Next, please. So th this one is basically, you know, like why you want to be involved in the Sphere uh, network. Basically, if you are looking for 
uh, your organization to be you know humanitarian protection assistance recovery and the resilience part i would say that yes you are selecting the right platform because if your organization is mandating humanitarian protection assistance recovery and resilience definitely the sphere network is going to help you out in a massive way if you and your organization is ensuring to uphold the rights and the dignity of the people you also want to in include the right to receive the humanitarian assistance for the people affected by crisis and also wants to give the right to protection security for the people then definitely yes you are on the right place and you can get lot of resources lot of benefits from this particular network and the last one is sphere is the most established and recognized organization in the field of humanitarian quality and accountability i will come back to you with this particular word of quality and accountability which we always use in a very frequent manner in most of our proposals we use quality accountability but what exactly that means actually and definitely these are the terms that has equipped me actually to be very honest uh, that what this terms means actually in the in the humanitarian sector next please so the sphere has also make this particular whole learning process in a very interactive and interesting way and they have partnered with uh, you know um, the cartoon networks and the center for education and research in the humanitarian actions and coming back to you so you i can access this resources from the sphere network any particular way if you have any specific things you can always talk to felicity and ask about those things but yes definitely these are the resources always available in our the sphere website that you can definitely talk about next please now sphere basically when we talk about the sphere definitely it is uh, one international standard but just to understand the sphere you need to understand that the, it is that particular network it not only gives you the sphere technical chapters or the sphere foundational chapters i will come back to those things but in this network in this family there are different other standards also which makes this particular whole part as interesting one is child protection standards livestock standards minimum economic recovery standards the educational standards minimum standards for market analysis the uh, minimum inclusion standards then the elderly people standards the camp management standards and the recent one that has came to you is the seeds thanks to a organization called crs who has taken that particular lead and this is the newest standard that has came into the whole family of the sphere which is called seeds and this standard is basically the crop related livelihood during the emergency you will see that all these standards that has been listed here in a one particular set of family have almost very you know the structure and the design of of drafting those standards are very very similar more or less same actually you can say so it will be very very easy actually to follow after the sphere so if you are aware about the sphere it will be much much easy to go through the child protection standards livestock standards you know economic recovery standards now these standards if you combine these standards where you can get these standards actually so the next uh, slide please hana so this is a site actually which is called humanitarian standard partnership and uh, this humanitarian standard partners partnership um, it is also you know you can go to their website and get that one and the best way to get this particular thing is to get on your mobile the mobile app is available actually and is very very good i mean i would say that mobile app is much better than then the things and in that mobile app you will get all the standards not only sphere but all the standards that i am listing out here either it is minimum economic recovery standard either it is seeds either it is chs seeds or legs whatever you want to it is just a 
um, you know, away from the fingertips, actually. Just press that one and it is available to you. Don't have to open your laptop always, actually. Next, please. So, you know, as I have mentioned that, you know, why this has been taken in just one particular platform. You can see that their approach, structure, and foundation across the handbooks are very, very same. I will I will show you some of the, you know, the handbooks that I have, which is not Sphere. If you can see my screen, you can see that is legs, and this is minimum economic recovery standards. These are the handbooks also available apart from the Sphere. And these are the structure is very, very same, like the standard key actions, um, you know, indicators and guiding notes. So this is the kind of the structure that we usually follow in Sphere. Same structure you will see in all these set of the standards. So it is much, much easy, actually. And I will recommend one thing that you can see that there is a legal framework, actually, legal framework, uh, you know, legal foundation to Sphere Act. And you can refer, if you have the Sphere handbook with you, you can refer to the page number 374, if I remember correctly. Um, but uh, someone else also can refer that one. Uh, but yes, I think it is 374. You can reach to that particular page and you can see that what is the legal foundation to the Sphere and these particular standards in a very unique way it has mentioned, majorly it has three sections. One talks about the human rights, another talks about international humanitarian law, and another talks about the refugee and IDPs. So this is this is the legal instruments which usually we use at the time of uh, application of the standards as well. Next, please. So next, please. We have already covered this. Yes. So when you will uh, open this mobile app, if you are, you know, open, the screen will come like this, actually. And that will be just uh, press one of the buttons, whatever is our of interest, either it is child protection or something like this. And those standards will definitely be there with you. Next, please. Now, just to introduce that, what is the meaning of the quality and accountability? As we don't have much time, so I will just brief you that what is the quality, the meaning of that quality, actually. So I'm giving one example to you. You are you have gone to a mobile shop to purchase a mobile phone, and the shop owner has explained that particular thing in a very nice way. You purchased one mobile with the looking at the parameters, the features, applications part, and all these things, and the beauty of the phone also. And finally, with a very happy mood, you came back to your home. And then you started, uh, you know, uh, you know, to gear up that particular phone. But the way the shop owner has told you, the mobile will work like this, the mobile is not working on that particular way. Whether you will be the same way happy the way you were there with the mobile shop i believe it is not your your happiness quotient will go down and when your happiness quotient will go down you will get some irritation actually why it is happening like this why it is not working so maybe you will go back to the shop owner and the shop owner will say that okay you are not working i will explain to you how to use it and he explains that particular thing in a much better way to you and then it start working again your you know happiness quotient is going up and then when you're happy you are referring that particular mobile to your family or friends or some other things that yes it is working well you can purchase this one also when you refer something which is good so when it is good then only you refer and when you are satisfied. So this particular word is, is called very, very satisfied. Particular component is important for the word quality. Once you are satisfied, the end user is satisfied, then it is of good quality. In a very similar way, in our humanitarian response program also, the services and the products that we are providing to the people affected by crisis, they need to be get satisfied and they have to watch that, yes, this is of good quality, not us. 
that yes we are always saying that our my program is very good it is a very good quality i think it is not a correct version actually the the statement should come from the end user the a disaster affected population who should give you the say that yes this is of good quality and the accountability part when the we are talking about the accountability component accountability comes when you transfer the power who is most powerful right now in a particular humanitarian context one has money who is the donor or the ngos or the local ngos who can provide some resources to the affected populations who have lost everything so the power needs to transfer to the people who doesn't have that power at this particular moment so this transfer of the power needs to be in a responsible manner when the power will transfer in a responsible manner then definitely it will be calling us accountability i will give another example if time permits okay next please now going back to uh, the the sphere standards the rwanda genocides you might have heard about this particular genocide in 1991 and uh, in this particular genocide you know so many thousands of people died because of ethnic clashes and because of that so many people have left that particular country also when the war stopped and we people the we organization started you know uh giving the relief operations to the people we have we are very satisfied actually i mean we means all the international agencies uh including uh, you know so many different organizations we were so happy that you know we have done a great job and we are patting each other's shoulder that mm, great we have done a great job and in that particular process we have gone for a joint need assessment but um, you know just the opposite of our uh, of our thought process the joint need assessment has given a very alarming result the joint need assessment says that there are unnecessary deaths because of lack of coordination of international ngos this is the statement not from my side i am just quoting the same statement which is written in the joint need assessment report if you want that report please you know you can reach out to me or hana in the sphere india network you can get that particular report as well next please and that particular you know you know uh the statement has you know created a lot of cries among the humanitarian organizations that what to do actually and that has made that particular sense that we need to standardize our way of working so that we can coordinate in a much much better way and those discussions converted into consultations and more or less like you know 400 organizations from 40 countries involved in a consultation process and finally the sphere took birth and in the first you know uh, 1997 uh, as uh, in the first handbook has been emerged actually during that particular time 1997 by humanitarian ngos and national red cross and red crescent movement to improve the quality of humanitarian response that means the satisfaction level which was not there based on our services that needs to be improved and more accountable that means the power at which we are transferring to the services that needs to be responsible then only it will be accountable you can see four different uh, uh sphere handbooks are on the screen uh you can see i am witnessing this particular part for a long period of time so this is the first handbook i have used if you can see my screen this is the first handbook has been given to me at the time of my training program followed by uh this one and then this one and finally i am right now using this particular handbook which is the purple color 2018 version so this is the latest version of the handbook 2018 which i always recommend to follow next please now what is this particular uh, you know uh, the standard you know intersects actually the sphere standards talks about the right to live with dignity this is basically the 
the principles of humanitarian charter actually the right to protection and security and right to receive humanitarian in assistance this is giving the humanitarian imperative and that gives a lot of strength to all of us to say that all possible steps needs to be taken by the agencies like us to alleviate the sufferings of the people affected by crisis and uphold their rights to the highest level and this is this is so important actually that all possible steps we have to think for the people who are affected by the crisis either it is a natural disaster or a man made or a conflict next please now if you look at the sphere uh, standard handbook there are majorly eight chapters so in the left side if you see there are four chapters which we call as foundation chapters it includes what is sphere what is humanitarian charter third is protection principles core humanitarian uh, standards these are called foundation chapters and the right side you can see there are another four chapters which are called technical chapters the first one is wash water sanitation hygiene promotion food security and nutrition shelter settlement and final one is health there are other you know annexes and the chapters also but majorly these are the eight chapters that helps you to design your whole humanitarian response portfolio from your organizational perspective next please so today i will not go with the foundational chapters i am not sure whether you have gone through or not if you have not gone through the the sphere before then definitely you can get back to me i will give you some ideas on those chapters as well uh, today i will just touch little base on the technical chapters like how to use this one how to how to use the technical chapters of the sphere in your humanitarian response part now let's start with the uh, wash water sanitation hygiene promotion to understand in a much better way i will uh, create a artificial situation let's assume that in your location a disaster happened say for example flood happened and because of the flood 1000 people have lost their houses and utensils and their reserves and their money i mean everything and they have been shifted to a new safe place where they are staying in some kind of the tents or something like this and then you are going to give some services to them so this technical chapters are basically denoting the four uh, basic needs of people the food water sanitation uh, shelter and healthcare services so basic needs actually without this basic needs the survival is very difficult so that's the reason why we always say these standards are also standards for survival so 1000 people have been dis displaced now how the sphere standards will help you out to design your program next please now these are these are the the wash standards water sanitation hygiene promotion now just for your information water sanitation and hygiene promotion has six categories actually so first category is water supply second one sanitation third one hygiene personal hygiene fourth one is drainage system then solid waste management and the disease control disease management so these are the five four or five or six categories that includes the was category sometimes you know we only provide water and say that we are providing wash which is not fully correct actually so when we are saying wash then these are the six categories technical categories that needs to be combined somewhere so that you can get the results in a more prominent way now let's take one example one of the indicator says that 15 liters per person per day that is the water needs to be given now the standard says 7 to 15 liters per person per day now you have you have 1000 people now with this particular standard 15 liters per person per day 
it will be much, much easy for you to calculate what will be the total quantity of water that you will be requiring to provide the water need of the people, that is 1,000, in a location where they don't have any other access. So if you are providing water, and this water, 15 liter, is basically for drinking, cooking, and personal hygiene. So three cut, three portions, for cooking, drinking, and personal hygiene. 15 liters, this is called minimum standards. So you can easily understand that how much water is required. Take another example of toilets. The sphere standard says that in the sanitation you know, section of the chapter, it says one toilet for maximum 20 people. Now you can imagine like you have 1,000 people in that location. So how many toilets needs to be there so that the disease should not spread? And these standards have not abruptly developed, actually. I have been engaged in this particular process for a long period of time. Each and every standard has a technical base, and a lot of consultation happened in different layers, from the grassroots level to the community, to the consultants, to the technical areas, to the academicians. And after that, these particular things came out. Now, just one thing I need to correct in my statement, these are indicators, not the standards. Standards are, for, for example, like, uh, you know, the 15 liters per person per day. So if you refer the sphere, it says the access to safe and adequate drinking water. That is the standard. And the indicator is 15 liters per person per day. So this is the, this is the way the whole process of the sphere standards has been designed. So it has sphere standard, then key actions, then indicators, and then guiding notes. Guiding notes talks about how you can implement those activities. Now, if you adopt these particular indicators and the standards, your proposal will be ready. Your approach to the humanitarian response is ready. If you are working on just wash, just refer this particular section, you know, from the page number 89 onwards, if you refer from the Sphere Handbook, you can see each and everything in a minute detail it is given. It looks like, you know, you are just moving from one step to the another step. Okay, next please. Next, uh, 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 just for that, you know, we had, don't have much time, so we are just going very quickly today. Uh, so the food security and nutrition. Now, for the food security and nutrition, it is always necessary for all of us to understand that what is the basis of the food security when we say it is the food security and then only you refer the sphere standards. Otherwise, it will be a little difficult for you to absorb the whole standards and indicators part of it. Next, please. So if you see in 2009, the declaration of the World Summit on Food Security, it says that all people at all times have physical, social, economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food, which meets their dietary needs and the food preferences for an active and healthy life. So this is the kind of a definition for the food security. And more or less with slight changes, we are following this particular, uh, you know, the uh, the definition in, in different uh, humanitarian context also. Whether you are following the sphere standards or not doesn't matter, but at least for the food security component, this is a kind of the, you know, the concept you can say right now, which we can follow rather than a statement. Next, please. So this has four, you know, major pillars actually. I have, this is not about the sphere. These are the basics actually of the food security. So the availability, accessibility, utilization, and stability. So the food needs to be available in the nearby areas and to the people. Not only that, if the food is available, then the food needs to be accessible to the people. When they are access to making the food, then they have to utilize that particular food, like eating in a proper way and proper nutritional intake. And the fourth one is stability. That is the consistency part of it. Consistent process of 
making that uh, thing possible. So these are the major components. I'm giving one example to you. There is a flood happened and it has destroyed the whole vegetation. All the crops damaged. Nearby markets are not there. That means the food is not available in that particular area itself. In that case, the only option could be by providing the kind support. Like you have to provide the, the food actually to, to the people because there is no food available across the things. Sometimes, you know, we heard that people have given cash, cash transfer programming. So they have given cash transfer programming with the cash vouchers or mobile, uh, mobile cash. They have given, but the market is not there. Food is not there in the thing. Even if they have the cash, they cannot purchase the food. So this is the kind of the thing, like if the food is not available at all, the basic idea is to provide the food in kind. And that's the point I am referring that when you are putting, referring to the Sphere Handbook, these basic concepts needs to be clear to you and your team members uh, so that you can go to the, the things. Now, when the food is available to the market, but the villagers, the flood affected population, they have lost something. But in the nearby market, the food is available. Then the point of accessibility comes actually. Okay. After that, when the food is accessible, then it, it needs to be cooked actually. So for the cooking, you need utensils, you need the firewood or the energy to make that particular thing possible. And in a proper manner, nutritious food needs to be consumed actually. So, so consumption and the making part that comes under the utilization component and stability is basically the consistent uh, process actually. Next please. Um, so um, now, um, ju just one thing I like to conclude for the food security part, one slide is missing for some reason here. Um, the food security part, say one standard of the food security says that in all possible means, the people should get 2,100 kilocalories per person per day. And to calculate that component, we usually include a food calculator, nutrition calculator, actually. And the basic items like rice, lentils, the, you know, uh, oil, uh, sugar, and salt. Majorly, these are the items that usually comes under under a, a package of the food. Say, for example, like 400 grams of rice per person per day, 20 grams of lentil. So there is a calculation which slide is missing at this particular moment, which I can share in the later part. Um, so this calculation part is different from country to country. Like in India, we definitely have the rice as a part of the carbohydrate. So carbohydrate, protein, fat, and the salt, with the iodized salt, this makes the whole package of the nutritional component and this gives you the 2100 kilocalories per person per day. Next, please. Now, next is the shelter. Very similar to the wash and the food, the next chapter, which talks about the shelter, it gives a lot of protection from the weather, from the external other sources. Um, it also gives the privacy. And one of the next, please. So one of the standard for the, uh, you know, the shelter and the settlement part is to make the tents or, you know, the shelters, temporary shelters. This basically, there are three major areas of the shelter support. One is the temporary or emergency shelter that usually we immediately build after the emergency so that people can get at least some protection from the rain or the sunlight or the wind or something like this. Second is transitional shelter, which is slightly better than the temporary shelter. It has some better equipments, uh, better, you know, structures part of it. And the third one is permanent. Usually in the humanitarian field, mostly we don't go for go for the permanent things because it has land issues part of it. Usually our response rotate and revolve around the temporary shelter and the transitional shelters. 
But when we are making this particular plan for 1,000 people, what are the things that you need to look at it? The roads and the footpaths, external cooking areas, communal cooking areas, educational recreation areas, healthcare facilities, sanitation, fire breaks, administration, water storage, side drainage, and religious activities, food distribution areas. For the whole part, like if these are the things needs to be there in that particular camp site where the people have been evacuated and staying, staying temporarily, these things needs to be there. And for which 45 square meters surface area is, is a some kind of the basic minimum area that needs to be there for, for the calculation part. So again, with the sphere standards, you can calculate that how much space you need to have to accommodate at least 1,000 you know, population there. Maybe in a first you need to combine in a family groups and then you know you can distribute that part of it. Next, please. Next, please. So the sphere standard about the about uh, the sphere, it says minimum 3.5 meters square of living space per person needs to be there. That is excluding their cooking area, bathing area, and sanitation facility. In most of the cases, we are not able to follow this particular standard. You might have also seen in, in India, or in any other Asian countries also, it is sometimes it is very difficult actually to, to get a open space like this for, you know, people of thousand people displacement part and all these things. So in that case, we usually decide not to keep thousand people in one place, but identify, you know, small places in different locations. Definitely the monitoring and management will be little critical, but that is the only way you can accommodate and maintain those standards. But it is it is really, really challenging actually. But it also helps in the whole process. I will give you another example, like the tents that we are making in the emergency shelter part of it. The height should be two meters. Why? Because, you know, and, you know, height will be two meters. And one tent should be distance with another tent with two meters. The reason behind that particular concept is that if for some reason one hut or the one tent is going down, it should not damage the another one. So that is the basic concept of the thing. So these are the things that you will get from the, the sphere uh, handbook uh, in, a, in a massive way. I'm just giving one or two examples uh, because of the time frame. Okay, next please. This is one example of the site planning actually that usually we have done in Jordan actually. So you can see that, you know, this is a huge camp, one of the biggest camp that, uh, you know, I have worked uh, in these particular segments and very, very promptly these particular camps has been designed. So, uh, you know, they have made the roads, they have made all the things that I was talking about, the recreational particular points, distribution points, youth centers, community office, recreational part of it, kindergarten schools, so educational services, all these things that they have incorporated in this particular piece of the land uh, as a part of temporary shelter arrangement, actually, or settlement arrangement in a much better way. Next, please. Next. This is this is uh, another example of shed nets, actually. You might have seen that these are the areas through which uh, and the concepts through which, you, uh, you know, people can stay together and uh, families together, staying together. That is a very good concept uh, today and uh, recent time. We are getting a lot of good quality tents these days. It is not the the previous level tarpaulins actually, or the plastic sheets. You might have seen in India, in Bihar and other places when the flood comes, peoples are staying in embankments and we provide the plastic sheets. That is that is not even included actually. Definitely, that is a good process to start with, but that needs to be replaced by, you know, the, 
the good tarpaulins, which has UV protection, uh, proper thickness for reducing the heat from the sun and the roofs. Otherwise, it will be really, really difficult for the people to stay. Sometimes it also happens like the plastic sheet things makes uh, life so miserable that, you know, the deaths has also been reported in the camps. So just to avoid those things, we need to be very sensitive towards uh, the materials and the items that we should use in the whole process of the shelter and settlement. Next, please. Other ways, um, you can also provide the training, you can provide the construction techniques, non-food items. What are the non-food items? Like uh, blankets, you can provide the mattresses, you can provide the dental kit, you can provide the morning freshness, you can provide dignity kits, you can give cash, a transfer program is you can do vouchers programs you can do cash for work programs you can use in different ways you can strengthen the whole process of these technical chapters next please um next please so um in healthcare uh, settings also like healthcare is a, the last technical chapter next please and in this particular chapter also, you can see that the sphere standards will give you the standards for communicable diseases, how you can manage those communicable diseases, child health, sexual and reproductive health, injury and trauma care, mental health, non-communicable diseases, and palliative care. So these are the seven subsections of the health segment that you can get from the sphere handbook, uh, the standards, indicators, and the guiding notes. Next, please. These are the some of the examples of the different companion standards that we usually call for the sphere. As I was talking about, uh, the standards for the elderly people, market assessments, uh, the child protection, uh, minimum standards for education, legs, uh, minimum economic recovery standards. So these are the books available in the things and you can uh, refer the page number eight uh, from the handbook uh, for much, much better ideas in those parts. Or you can also go to your uh, mobile app and easily you can get th those things from your app itself. Very, very good standards. They are very nice standards. Next, please. Now, how I have used uh, this, uh, uh, the, uh, the handbook actually for so far. Next, please. So I have used this particular handbook and it was very, very useful when you are doing meal. That is monitoring, evaluation, accountability and learning process. So when I'm developing the tools, then definitely you can get that one. You will get one particular tool that I have developed for the Sphere uh, uh, Sphere Geneva office, which is called audit tools. So if you want, if you are going to audit the Sphere indicators to a different other organizations, whether they are following that particular part or not, that particular thing is called audit tools. Audit tool, which is which is for the practice practitioners like us actually newcomers. I would. Uh, you know, suggest not to use those uh, tools. Just equip yourself, equip your hands on those tools and then only apply those things. But yes, definitely it is very, very useful for, for the things. Program design, negotiation with donors, advocacy, developing policies, quality assurance, need assessment, program reporting, research, training, proposal, writing and the job evaluations. When I'm recruiting people for different purposes, definitely the Sphere Handbook is always with me to, to put those requirements actually, which I am looking for in that particular job uh, description. So these are the ways I have used the Sphere in last, uh, you know, you can say 10, 15 years. Next, please. These are some of the links that you can refer in your uh, free time. Uh, very, very useful things. I have given the Humanitarian Standard Partnership link. There is an interactive handbook also, the Sphere Handbook. The beauty of this particular thing is that if you are not interested to... Um, for, you know, foundational chapters and straight away you want to go to the, the shelter 
chapter. Just click the shelter button and you will be straight away going to the, the sphere handbook, uh, sphere chapter, uh, shelter chapter. So this is the best way to go through this particular thing, interactive book. Free online courses are available in different ways, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And the last slide from my side would be, next please. The I always suggest that, uh, you know, along with the sphere, you need to also study the basics of international humanitarian law, faith sensitive humanitarian response, Geneva Conventions, professional standards for protection work and protocols additional to Geneva Convention 1949. We can wrap up this insightful session today. I want to um, like... I was very happy to listen to both the speakers on how they emphasize the critical importance of understanding and implementing and especially normalizing uh, these humanitarian standards. In this current time, uh, as you all know, the humanitarian risks and violations are escalating. And it is very imperative that we, uh, you know, capacitate ourselves with the knowledge and commitment to uphold these uh, standards. So on behalf of Sphere India, I would like to extend a heartfelt thank you to our trainer, Subhashi sir, for facilitating the session. Uh, despite the time constraints, you managed to cover the technical chapters with uh, great clarity. It, we kind of got a very good structure on uh, what each chapter includes and where to look at if we, if, like, if we are planning to delve into these chapters. And thank you so much for your dedication to this course. Uh, and uh, we really appreciate your time and efforts that you invested in you know, enriching our understanding. Thank you so much. And I would also like to uh, give a special acknowledgement to Felicity for from Sphere. Uh, your invaluable insights have en enhanced our perspectives on these standards. And thank you so much for being with us and responding to the questions in the chat box. You you were giving links, which was in a timely appropriate. Thank you so much for that. And we really wish that uh, we uh, con continue this collaborations and do more sessions like this. Um, and uh, finally, thank you to all the participants. We have a lot, like a majority of our registrations were from grassroots level organizations and NGOs this time. And we thank you all for joining. We will be sharing a feedback form. So if you require more trainings or any um, any other specific technical trainings, please do not hesitate to let us know. And uh, thank you all. Once again, uh, I would like to wish you all a good day. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm also flashing the upcoming uh, sessions, uh, which we will be organizing in the month of February. So if you would like to register for any of the sessions, you'll be getting emails. Yeah. This way. Also, you can scan in the QR to access any of the previous recording. Once again, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much to thank all you. of you. Thanks, Thanks all.